As a fifth generation farmer, Marie's focus on presentation will focus on how farming practices have progressed since the days of her grandpa, and Gordon will present on forestry for tonight. So, we'll let you take it away, Marie. Sorry, I just want to say one thing we forgot. Um, we're doing video, which we uh, will post this video to YouTube. So when it does come to question and answer later, if there's anyone who does not want their face to be on a video <laughs> on the internet, please let us know so that we don't get you, um, get you on video at that time when you do a question. Okay, just wanted to let everybody know that disclaimer right now. <laughs> uh, good evening, everybody. Okay, so it's not working on here, but it's working up there. Fantastic. I love it. Um, oh, sure. Oh, and I realize we're in the block for the bathroom, too. <laughs> so <laughs> if someone has an emergency, just scream fire and we'll all go somewhere. No, I'm kidding. Don't scream fire. Bad idea. Um, and my husband told me not to tell jokes tonight. I'm already doing it. <laughs> so <laughs> oh, there we go. <laughs> All right, so we're Lane Families for Farms and Forests. Um, we started in the spring of 2016 as we realized that a lot of people don't understand, don't know what's happening in the fields and forests as they're driving along I-5, driving Highway 99. And um, we came up with this mission sa statement, committed to harnessing support for Lane County's rich heritage of agriculture and forestry, two cornerstones of our local community because Lane County you know, started with farming and forestry and it's still a very viable and important industry here today. And like I said, we re took a realization in spring of 2016, you know, said, you know, we need to get out and talk to people in our community because we're part of the community and no one's going to go stop alongside the road and ask me what I'm doing in my field or find Gordon in the trees and see what he's doing in the trees. Um, so we wanted to get out and start talking about what we're doing, talking about why we do what we do and why we love what we do. So I'm Marie. I'm looking a little different tonight than I looked up there. I'm a fifth generation farmer. Um, we prim primarily farm grass seed, um, sometimes wheat when the price is all right, metafoam, and other seed crops. Uh, my husband Tristan's here tonight. He joined the farm in 2013 when I said, working with your family is really fun and everyone gets along all the time. <laughs> and he believed me and then we got married and now he doesn't believe me anymore. So <laughs> And then, of course, I'm president of Lane Families for Farms and Forests, and we farm in Lynn and Lane counties. Um, currently, Tristan and I live in Coburg, Oregon, on a piece of property that was part of my grandma's, uh, my grandma's great grandparents' donation land claim in 1865. Uh, the name of our farm is Bashaw Land and Seed, and I don't know if you guys probably don't know what Bashaw is. Um, it's a type of soil. It's a really crappy, poor draining type of soil, but it grows annual ryegrass really, really well. And that's mostly what our farm is made of. So um, that's why we grow what we grow, because our soil dictates that for first and foremost. And then when my grandpa retired in 1996, this is the farm my dad established. So anyway, um, and I'll tell you more about our farm in a little bit. But that's my family when my great grandma was still alive. She lived to be uh, 97 years old. So. Well, good evening, everyone. I'm glad to see we've got such a good crowd. It's an interesting uh, opportunity. My name is Gordon Culbertson. I have uh, been a resident of Lane County all my life, and uh, have been working in the forest industry virtually all of my working years. Uh, I'm a small woodland owner. Uh, we own a little company called Whitewater Forests. Our tree farms are certified by the American Tree Farm System and the Oregon Tree Farm System and I'm the vice chair of Lane Families for Farms and Forests. Our working in the land is, is really pretty deep in our family. For well over 100 years, someone in our immediate family has made their living either farming or working in forestry. And so, it is uh, something that, uh, that we do naturally. Uh, this picture here is my son. My son and daughter are actively engaged in the management of our business. And uh, 
we really enjoy doing it together. So just some basics about Lane County in case you guys didn't know, just to kind of start from the basics, we're in Lane County. Um, it was established in 1851. Uh, the population then was 4,780, and today it is now the fourth largest county by population and the sixth largest county by land area. So let's talk about some Lane County agriculture. As you heard in the trivia question, we have over 2,600 farms. In 2012, the Lane County had agricultural sales of 142 million, and then farming, you know, like I said, fifth generation, been farming land that's been in my family for over 100 years, and you know, 98% of farms are family owned and operated, which you guys all learned in the trivia, so. <laughs> and again, this is another trivia question, so 220 commodities, and on the bottom is our top 10 commodities, which I think Lane County has all of them pretty much, except for maybe potatoes commercially grown. Um, we grow a plethora of crops. Like I said, we mainly grow grassy, but I know there are hazelnut farmers in the room. I know that there are livestock producers in the room and milk producers in the room. And then um, also, my favorite one is, did you guys know that Lane, Lane County and Benton County grow like the most sugar beet seed in the nation? <laughs> Which I kind of find it interesting because then it goes off and becomes a beet and then gets processed into sugar. And so if you want to buy local Lane County sugar, just go buy the bag of sugar in the store that's just labeled sugar. So yeah, you can buy local Lane County sugar. Um, and then that's a picture of Metafoam. Do you guys know what Metafoam is used for? Yeah, it's an oil, takes place of the, the sperm whale oil and um, it's used in high energy cosmetics. It's one of um, a rotational crop for us. So let's talk about how farming's changed since the days of my grandpa. Um, this photo is a little older than my grandpa, but that's what a combine looked like in the you know, 1920s versus what it looks like now. Uh, you had pretty much three people operating a combine, and now we have 15-year-old kids operating combines. So <laughs> I don't know which is less stress, but um, it's, we've definitely increased efficiency. We used to have um, seven wind doors or seven swath or stuff that we cut the grass with, and now we are down to um, two, three wind doors that we cut the grass with. And it's become a lot easier not working 24 hours a day. It's a lot easier to get some sleep during the cutting season so you don't exhaust yourself to death. Um, another thing that we've changed is um, in our seed cleaning facility, we have an automatic stacker, which takes the place of one person and then eliminates that labor, but also then stacks bags nice and neat so they're not falling over when you stack them in a pile. So then increased precision, which I will talk about here in a little bit. So, um, confession, I don't know how to plow. <laughs> I've never ran a plow in my life. Um, we, I don't even think we still own a plow on the farm. We, it might be back in the Blackberry somewhere. And we just sold our big tillage disc this year because we don't use them anymore. Um, that's because soil is our most valuable commodity. We, and we're not the exception to the rule. We are the rule all farmers and, f and try to do this is to minimize impact and compaction. So we have different systems on the farm that we use. Um, we do still use some full tillage where we rip up the soil and then work it under. And, um, but that's, we don't use that very often. I don't think we've maybe a quarter of the farm, this not even that, less than a quarter of our farm this year was full tilled. Um, we try to rotate through because again, soil, we want to, it's <laughs> soil dictates what we do. And if we don't, have, if we don't treat it well, it won't treat us well. And so we also have minimum tillage, which is um, when we use full tillage, it's typically that we have a pest problem in the field. We have weed problems that we need to get rid of, um, and it's one method to use, but it also takes a lot of tractor time and a lot of diesel and a lot of, um, yeah, it's just, it's not, I mean, it's a great tool and still need necessary, but again, we don't utilize it that much. And then we have minimum tillage, which utilizes a little bit more which then we'll go through and break up the stubble and make a nice seed bed for the seeds to go plant into. Um, and we have these fancy discs that go real fast. And then we also do no-till. And I, you know, no-till, I hear it all the time as a buzzword and our farm's been doing no-till for probably three decades now. So it's nothing new, <laughs> new to us, but that's where we go. And so that's my drill down there. I do all the planting on the farm and that's my tractor. And so, I can re do regular planting or I can no-till in the seeds, which means I have discs in the front that cut into the soil for a little seed bed. The seed's planted and the fertilizer's planted and then a packer wheel comes along and kind of packs it down nicely. So, um, and then we do a lot of volunteering. 
So if a crop, say, and a golf annual ryegrass field or a tetraploid annual ryegrass field has been established in one place for a really long time, um, typically we can let that go for a year and it'll grow back to the same seed. And um, yeah, it's a good way not to get out on the field and make a mess and not a good way to burn diesel. So as again, uh, soil determines the crop. I guess I should mention also that a third of our farm is located in the Coast Fork watershed. We farm between Goshen and Cresswell. And so I do have a vested interest in what you guys are doing. And um, Camaswell Creek runs right there. And that's what we call it. We call it Camaswell. So the foil, the photo on the left is actually a photo of Camaswell, the soil. Um, it's a soil called Natroy, which is even worse clay than Bashaw. And in the summertime, you guys have probably seen this down here where it cracks and you can stick your hand down or lose a bunch of tools down it too as well if you broke down. And so, but again, it grows annual ryegrass really well. We also have a, um, in the same area, we also have a wetlands down here and in the Coast Fork watershed, I guess you say, because we had a one field that just, it was better as a wetlands than it was a producing f grass seed field. So we converted it about seven years ago to a wetlands. And so it's got ponds out there and we worked with the US Fish and Wildlife Service to do that. Um, and so, but it grows, that's what we grow out there is annual ryegrass because it's not gonna grow tall fescue, which is on the picture on the right, which the green stuff's tall fescue, turf type tall fescue, which goes to lawns. And then the picture on the, or the yellow stuff on the right is a canola field. So we're always trying to figure out what we can grow with what soil we have and what's gonna be the best rotational crop because we try to make that work. Um, this is my soapbox story, the annual ryegrass will save the world. I had to throw this in here. <laughs> and, um, basically, I mean, it feeds sheep, it feeds cows. Uh, it goes to China and feeds the carp, right? The, the, yeah. And uh, it also um, has been it's growing as in the cover crop market in the Midwest because it's a nitrogen scavenger. So when corn farmers or soybean farmers plant annual ryegrass, they've found that it'll take up the extra nitrogen that's left over from the corn and the soybeans. And actually, um, you know, the Gulf, Gulf of Mississippi has a large algae bloom, and it's actually starting to help um, cure that up and clean up the waters and because they, they have some erosion issues and some <laughs> other soil quality issues. And then the newest thing, I mean, that's the thing about uh, what we do. So annual ryegrass has been around for a really, really long time, but they're still finding new uses for it. They're still finding ways it can improve things. Um, so does anyone know what Fragipan is? <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's basically like a cement of soil that can't be broken up. And so then they have a really shallow seedbed. And in Kentucky and in parts of the Midwest is a problem. Well, they've now found that if they plant annual ryegrass, there's something in the, well, the roots will go down and break through. And then there's chemicals in the roots that continue to break up this fragipan that makes their soil more productive for them. So this is just, I pulled this that um, from a study here. There's this article in 2016 about the researchers believe annual ryegrass is key to breaking fragipan. So again, I say annual ryegrass will save the world, so we'll just see one day. And it also is um, an erosion. It helps prevent erosion as well against the cover crops, plant on the hillsides after um, a forest harvest or whatever. So, Okay, so as again, I said soil is one of our number one, um, it's you know our top priority. So here is our fertilizer buggy. Okay, so that's our old fertilizer buggy in the top left corner. It's stuck. That's not good. <laughs> it's not good for the soil. It's not good for blood pressure. It's not good for anything. And so that was 2013, I believe. So then the next year, we had this plan. We added tracks to our buggy, which then minimized the surface compaction and increased surface area. Um, and But we still had a front tire on it, which in a really more saturated soils, it's challenging as well because it pushes mud around. And so now we're improving again. This is just an example in the last, I guess, five years, what we've done to try to improve, trying to improve and lower the impact on our soil is we recently purchased a new tractor or not a new to us tractor, which is called a road track. And it can spread out its tracks. So you're not going following track to track. And then we purchased this fertilizer spread out of Germany and we're gonna attach the back of the tractor and hopefully minimize our, um, our soil compaction. What did you say it was pounds per square inch, Tristan? 4.6 pounds per square inch of weight will be going across the field with this thing. Um, the cool thing about this, so 
Yes, our fertilizer spreader had a computer that calculated how many pounds per acre it was putting out. And this one will do that too, but it also recalibrates the spinners every 15, 15 minutes, 15 seconds, every 15 seconds. And then it also has the capability of sensing the wind. And so it'll sense the wind and readjust the throw pattern to compensate for the wind speed, which I don't know, that's pretty cool. Like <laughs> you take away sowing, you take away overspreading, you take away, you know, you know just all kinds of fantastic, you won't have strips in fields anymore where you miss a spot of fertilizer, hopefully, unless you're a bad driver like I was last year. Um, yeah, so. And then, so as I mentioned, um, GPS is part of it. So we have our yield maps, um, auto steer and water management and then application accuracy. This is a picture of um, my computer in my planter tractor and I'm on an AB line because I can't drive straight to save my life so thankfully there's auto steer. And um, it's these little black triangles dropping out while I'm taking a survey of the field while I'm driving along and I'll show you what that does in a second. Um, and then along with it, you know, it meters out how, much, how many pounds per acre of seed I'm putting out how much fertilizer I'm putting out, um, yeah. And one of the coolest things that we have gotten recently is um, on my dad's sprayer, we have a 12 section boom control. So it's a 100 foot sprayer. And uh, he recently, you know, went to 12 sections. And so, you know, sometimes we say, oh, we you know, w it'll be, you know, 0.5 acres. Well, now our acres are to the exact acre the field's measured and because of the accuracy of the sprayer. And he's using the exact amount of materials that he needs and so there's no overlap, there's no nothing, and it's amazing. <laughs> so, um, okay, so this is actually one of our fields down here in the Camas Well. And so we use this, this is one of our yield maps. And you're probably looking at the numbers on the side saying why, you know, those, those orange and red spots are where the goose damage was. So I don't know if you guys noticed that geese Geese have become a problem in Oregon. They don't go where they're supposed to go in the more during the time the years are supposed to go. So <laughs> and so my dad's on a goose task force and he wanted to show the goose task force, you know, this is the damage to our field. So I pulled up the yield map and I was able to calculate that 38% of our acres were affected. Uh, we had a 41% yield loss. And uh, because of that, we lost $380 an acre that year because of geese damage. And uh, you know, it was, uh, we. We watched them all winter long sit in those spots, so we knew exactly where it, what happened. Um, it's not like I just guessed that's where the geese were. We've been watching them. So that's, um, that's one of the things we use the yield maps for. Another funny story is when uh, we pulled up a yield map to see if a certain type of crop oil that we put on worked. And we couldn't figure out why the pattern was, the yield was better in a certain area than it was in the rest of the field. And then I pointed out to my dad, that's when I took over driving the wind drawer. <laughs> and when I got in it, you had left me with a, a, a plugged header for mis most of the field, apparently. So <laughs> that just makes you feel good when you can one-up your dad once in a while. So another um, water management's huge on our farm. Clearly, we have saturated soils, and we want to get the. We don't want water standing there. We don't want drowned out crop. We don't want you know stagnant water. We want to keep it moving. So we um, we make ditches on our farm. We do land forming, we do some tiling on different types of property. Um, here, the map to the right is a topo topographic map that I created from a, the tractor. And it, when I load it into my computer program, it'll show me the flow paths of the water, and it'll show me lines of those natural ditches, that they, the major ditches in the field. And then I can go along, and because when you work the field, it's just flat, and then it's not, but they show where the drainages are supposed to be. So then I'll go along and draw the ditches, and my dad will put it into his computer. I'll draw them, load it on a thumb drive, give it to my dad. He will go make the ditch. And um, But now he also has the ability in his tractor to go where, he, you know, again, people with lots of decades of experience can look at a field and say, that ditch needs to go right there. I can't do that. I like my computer. <laughs> I'm sure one day I'll be there. But my dad will look and say, well, I think, no, the ditch needs to be there. And so he'll drive where he knows where the ditch needs to be. The computer surveys it while he goes along he puts in what slope he wants it at, and it comes back and it cuts it at that slope to different heights to make sure it's perfectly there so the water flows efficiently out of the field. It's pretty cool. And then this picture down here is our newest um, land forming water management tool. It's called a swing blade. And what it does is, um, so I surveyed 
this bottom right field, and that's what the pattern was. As you can see, those are the flow paths, apparently. This field had been plowed around and around and around and around, and, and someone else tried to put a ditch in that wasn't in the right spot. So not saying that previous people just didn't do it the way they should have been doing it or not paying attention, something like that. I don't want to talk bad about my neighbor farmers, but you know. Um, so we, to survey the field, I plugged it into um, our program on the computer. We then did some calculating with some ratios because you got to account for how much you'll like melt down. And then that's the shape of the field it's supposed to be. As you can see, all the ditches are going towards one main ditch and flowing out to where they should go. And um, hmm? well, it's the flow patterns, I should say. Like the it changed the shape of the field so the water flows to the, where the natural way it should be. So. And then this is what we call a cut fill map. And it shows that um, all that blue area needs to get filled in and all the yellow areas where he's going to cut from. My husband runs the land plane, so he could tell you more about it. But 0.58 feet is how much he needs to fill, which is what, a little over six inches, seven inches. And um, he's cutting close to, I guess, a little less than a foot of wherever he goes around and finds the dirt. And the computer will automatically find the dirt and cut and fill where it needs to do. It's pretty, pretty cool. So I've really just touched on a few things because I know we're short on time. So, because <laughs> um, we have lots of cool technologies and just amazing, it just it blows my grandpa's mind, you know, when he tells me he used to have to haul bags of fertilizer to the fertilizer buggy when now we just have a truck that we dump it out of. Um, and, you know, we're innovative. Like I showed you the track picture and stuff like that. You know, so, but our goals are to continue. We, I'm fifth generation, you know. We continue to think about the future and what we want to do, but it's not without challenges for sure. Um, I didn't touch, you know, we have a, a slug problem, as you guys heard in the trivia question, and there's no real solution for that, and we need tools and um, innovative ways to figure out how to deal with that. I mean, we have an Oregon State slug re researcher right now, but how many years till we find the solution? Um, there are, are options out there, but they're not necessarily available to us. Um, labor, as labor is a challenge for everybody, um, mostly since we hire teenagers in the summertime, we find it hard that they don't really like to work long hours. And I think our sea clean warehouse lost a guy every week, every day or every week this summer. So it was pretty, pretty challenging. And then, you know, again, people, why lane families for farms and forest start, people don't understand what we're doing and why we're doing it out there. So we wanted to get start telling people, telling you about this cool technology because it blows my mind every day and I love it. Um, and then we have a growing population with less and less people working in agriculture, so that's also a challenge. And right now I'll turn it over to Gordon, he can tell you about forestry in Lane County. Okay. Well, let's, let's shift over to forestry. About 90% 90, 90 of Lane County is forest land. About 35% of it is privately owned and the remainder is owned by the federal and state government. Uh, Lane County is the number two timber producing country or county in the United States. And it is second only to uh, Douglas County. Oregon's forest acres have remained unchanged since 1953, and this time there's been considerable harvesting, and Oregon's forests have built about 25 million homes. Uh, Douglas fir is the most common species that we find in uh, the forests of Oregon, western Oregon. Looking at uh, logging then and now, it's changed quite a lot here over the last uh, century. Since 1972, Oregon forest operations have been regulated by the Oregon Forest Practices Act, and that Forest Practices Act has been updated consistently throughout that time. That law requires reforestation, protects soils, water, and wildlife habitat. Uh, production of wooden paper products needed by society employ thousands of people in the state of Oregon. Well, our primary business is uh, we are a small woodland owner. And uh, I wanted to kind of share with you who the profile 
of Oregon's small forest owners. Family forests are made up of ownerships up to uh, 5,000 acres. There's about 70,000 individual owners and they own about 4 million acres total. Roughly speaking, it, that's just slightly less than the number of acres owned by industry. These forests uh, provide clean water, wildlife har habitat, carbon storage, plant diversity, open space, wood products, and a significant contribution to our economy. The harvest for the small woodland owners is about 400 million board feet annually, or about 10% of the total wood pro products produced in the state. So I'd also like to, at this time now, tell you a little bit about our business. It's called Whitewater Forests. In 2000, we established that family business. Uh, the purpose of it was to kind of get back to the land. Our family farms had been sold, and both my wife and I had a desire to really continue in that heritage and to share that heritage with our children and our grandchildren. As I said, the connection to the land is very important to our family. Our, my mother's family first came to the United States from Sweden and started farming in the 1880s. We have uh, two separate ownerships that total about 120 acres. Our lands are certified under the American and Oregon tree farm systems and we're active members in the Oregon Small Woodlands Association, which is a, a trade group and an educational group that uh, the membership are people that own small forest land tracts. Our goal is intensive management of forest, among other things. And we're very fortunate in the uh, age class of our forests, we can have a commercial harvest about once each decade. We have um, a number of regulatory uh, considerations. We have fish bearing streams. I'll show you some examples of that later. Scenic hi highway corridor and one of our properties has an adjacent spotted owl nesting site. And we've had about four generations that have been involved in uh, our family forest lands. The uh, American Tree Farm certification, uh, I'm not going to go through this point by point, but a couple of things that I'm very interested in, uh, vegetation, soil type, uh, the historical reference of our property, and I'll talk a little bit about our uh, historical reference as well. Fish and wildlife compatibility, uh, water resources, and uh, recreation are something that we're very interested in. This chart shows the age class distribution of our land. And uh, on the extreme left are trees that are 50 years and older. And then uh, in the second one, the third one over to the left, uh, are trees that are less than five years old. So we have a, a variety of age classes on our property. One thing that I would like to, to share with you is uh, on the extreme right are lands that are set aside by regulation, federal and state regulation that we're not able to practice forestry on. And that is uh, about 7% of our total acreage. And then the non-forest is an old homestead. 2003 was our first timber harvest, and this is uh, at our uh, small woodland down at Elkton, Oregon. After harvest, we planted uh, 400 seedlings to the acre, and this is that same site when those trees were nine years old. This picture was taken uh, uh, several years ago now. As I said, water quality, fish habitat, and stream protection are issues that are important to us. This uh, stream on the right-hand side there 
is in a buffer strip. That's in a harvest buffer strip. That is a small fish bearing stream. Uh, we developed a written plan with our stewardship forester. That written plan allowed us to harvest some valuable trees while in the same, uh, at the same time leaving what was required uh, excess in basal area. Basal area, just if you know what that is, that's the area covered by the, by the uh, base of the tree. And I think that this was a very successful outcome. That's a really nice looking stream buffer and uh, we have a lot of fish, run in, have fish that run in that every year. Um, currently, there have been some new prescriptive rules that were put in place this, this, last, this last year. And really, to tell you the truth, I think that uh, those rules are probably not going to allow us to be as successful with a collaborative effort as it's very prescriptive, a one-size-fits-all measure and it will also increase the restricted acres on our land. As I said, um, care of roads, drainage, and just the care of water resources are very important to us. When we acquired this property, trespassers had been running through there uh, as a shortcut between a power line right of way and the county road and really had torn up the road. And this is actually adjacent to where a fish stream passes uh, under the road. And so one of our uh, first priorities when we bought the property was to try to work uh, collaboratively, collaboratively with uh, the Department of Forestry and to also work with uh, uh, the Bonneville Power Administration who has an easement who that's how they were you know, getting, getting onto the property. First thing we did is we put in a gate to secure access and to keep uh, trespassers out. And then we uh, went to work uh, repairing that section of the road, placing some perf pipe in so it would drain properly and uh, making sure that the, the drainage carried to an appropriate spot. This is that same area four years later and we have taken good care of it. I'm very proud of the way that looks and that's an all season road now that we can we can use that year round. Uh, this is an example on one of our harvest units of, of our mechanized site preparation. And we use prescribed burning. This is a unit, this is the last unit that we harvested that the trees are about five years old now. And uh, that is that, uh, that harvest unit that's looking right where we, pretty much where we uh, burned. Invasive species are always a big challenge for us. Um, you know, I, I make an effort, particularly with the Scotch broom, to try to get every Scotch broom plant that I see. And uh, I took this one one day more as a joke than anything because I thought I had all the Scotch broom and I looked out there and saw that. That's taller, taller than I am. Uh, we are in the process of thinning uh, some 25-year-old forest of ours. Uh, we have about, uh, on, this, on this area, about 300 trees to the acre. We're thinning it down, leaving the best 180 to 200 trees per acre. And then we uh, prune those trees up about as high as I can reach with a power saw when we're done. Uh, this is kind of an interesting picture. The, uh, on the right is an old springboard stump. You can see the notch in it. And that, that tree was harvested by the Penn Lumber Company in about 1920. And then the uh, stump that's in the upper uh, foreground was harvested in 1992. And then uh, one of the thinning stumps right, right below there. So there's quite a, quite a number of years history there. And then to, to finish up, um, I, sh I showed that we had part of our acreage that was in a homestead. And this is a historical area uh, out in the, pen uh, the old community of what was called McGlynn on Wildcat Creek. Uh, years ago, there was a uh, mill there called the Penn Lumber Company. Uh, this was an old homestead. Those are two of the, 
the biggest walnut trees I've ever, I've ever seen. And uh, we use that as a uh, family picnic spot, gathering spot, and we have our family meeting there every year to talk about what we're, you know, what we're gonna do on our land. Uh, it's a very special spot to us, and I must say that the history has been kind of one of my, the history of that area has become one of my, my hobbies. I think that one of, the, one of the key things about Lane Families for Farms and Forests is that we are interested in creating an environment that our families can carry these businesses on after we're, after we're gone. Would you like to take over? Sure. Thanks, Gordon. Well, as you can see, you know, our, our farms and forests are sustainable. Oh. <laughs> yes. Our uh, family farms and forests are sustainable, generational, and that we're, we are really committed to the community and what we want to do to make sure we're part of it, too. We want to make sure what we're doing is the best for it and everyone um, make sure it's available for, the, what, for future generations and continues to be a vital industry. So um, that's kind of what we had. I mean, I can put up what we've done and the activities we've done recently or community events. We have um, ag... Fact sheet, Ag, Lane County Ag and Forestry fact sheets as you guys came in and hope you grabbed some. We have brochures about who we do. And if you're interested in any of our future events, there's a sign-up sheet um, there, too, so we can keep you on our email list. Um, but I guess we can open it up for Q&A now or, yeah. Oh, we're ahead of schedule? High five, Gordon. <laughs> Great. I mean, as I, don't wear this, you know. I guess I can put up, you know, as a group, we really try to do some community outreach groups to, ah, oh, sorry. There's Ed. Um, <laughs> uh, community, so we've had a kickoff party. We've had feasts in the forest, feasts on the farm. We did a meet and greet with the um, Lane County Historical Society. Um, and the feast events have been, um, we also did a, t a community tour. We really tried to put the focus on, you know, our local farmers and foresters and what we do and getting the um, ingredients from the local farms, like I said, even the sugar. <laughs> so, um, yeah, again, if you guys want are interested in attending one of those, please put up on our sign-up sheet. And I think that's pretty much it about just a little plug about our organization. You can visit us on our website, too, lanefamilies.com. <laughs> All right, well, thank you so much. Um, I just, if there is, you know, we could do a little bit more raffle ticket sales too. So if anybody wants to do that, uh, just put your hand up and we'll come around for you. Um, otherwise, we can probably start question and answer. If everybody can just say your answer clearly and the speaker will be pre um, repeating the question so that it's sure to be clear, uh, especially for our YouTube video. Well, first of all, I'm very sorry to hear about your, about your friend. And uh, when that happens, that's a tragedy. Um, the cause of that would not, you know, what you, your statement, what you've said that that is the cause, wouldn't fit with my experience. And so I think that uh, uh, we'll just have to agree to disagree on that because I have a different view of that than you do. That's a tough question. He wants to know how much of our Oregon grassy goes to turf and how much goes to cover crop. Well, 
I don't know the exact answer for that. <laughs> Maybe somebody else might, but I do know, as I said, Lynn County is the grass seed capital of the world, and that's the grass seed capital of the world because of annual ryegrass. And annual ryegrass, again, I said, will save the world. But, you know, it goes into pastures, it goes into cover crops, it goes over overseas to feed animals. And um, I guess another tidbit I didn't mention is our annual ryegrass straw goes and feeds Wagyu beef. So when you pay a lot of money for your Wagyu beef, you know, you could just buy an organ beef like from Bill over here and it'll be eat just good, eat just as good as grass. So, but anyway, I don't, sorry, I don't have the percentage of turf. Do you know the answer? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, we don't, we only have one turf type fescue field on currently. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, so we mo we do no-till and we grow mostly annual ryegrass, so we rotate metafoam in. So there's a limited amount of crops we can rotate with annual ryegrass because of um, the wet, the, the soil, and um, how wet it likes it. So metafoam actually does like to be, likes wet feet. Um, we can't plant wheat where we grow annual ryegrass. We can't plant other types of seed crops. And about a third of our farm actually really only supports wheat or other crops that don't like to be so wet. So... Um, and we're always looking for new varieties. Like we were in the trying canola because we figured we wanted to see how it did on wet soils. Turns out canola doesn't like wet soils either. So <laughs> um, if you know of something, you know, we're always looking for something else. So. Uh, typically, our, our rotation age that, that we shoot for is at least 50. And... Uh, we have older trees than that, but um, you know we uh, we have a plan that allows us to cut uh, at a time of our choice, and so the age may vary just a little bit. For Gordon, uh, about how old are the trees in the regulatory set aside acres, and do you do any any work off farm with uh, helping other foresters be more sustainable? Yes. Um, the, the trees in the, in the set aside are of a variety of ages. Some of them are trees that we've planted that since the time we planted them, regulation has, uh, has taken that area. Uh, some of the trees are very large. For instance, the trees in the uh, stream buffer that I showed you the pictures of, a lot of those trees are, you know, some of them are well over 100, 100 years old. Uh, and yes, I do some, some work with other landowners that I have worked with for a, a number of years uh, and uh, help them to develop uh, management plans and to manage their harvest and reestablishment of their trees. So what are you yes? Doing to manage I, I'm sorry, what's that? I, I use I use both. I use both uh, handwork and I use chemicals depending on the the amount uh, of area that I have to work with. Some of our property had a lot of invasive species when I first inquire, acquired it, so I used quite a lot of uh, spraying at one time. I think I sprayed each of the uh, that sprayed that property once, and then um, my preferred method for scotch broom is I pull it by hand. That's the easiest. And uh, typically, if uh, once you get it under control, you can do that on a small acreage. But on some of my larger areas, if I had a problem, I'd spray it again. And what do you spray? What, what do I spray? Oh, you know, I'm not going to get into a whole list of chemicals and go through it, but it's just... Uh, herbicides that uh, are commercially available and that are licensed for forestry. Sometimes, uh, sometimes not. Yes.
Yeah, I, I don't think I'm going to have any luck repeating your question. Thank you for, for sharing, your, sharing your thoughts. And let me see if I can address a few of those points. Uh, first of all, yes, we do have a thriving industry. Probably the biggest detriment that we have today is that there are not enough uh, people actually wor working in our industry. And, uh, well, thank you, again. Um, and and uh, I do believe that, uh, yes, we do uh, pr practice sustainable forestry on our land. I am not in agreement that our logging laws, as you said, are not adequate. I think as uh, anyone who has studied the Forest Practices Act would know we've made changes as we go along. And uh, I don't consider it to be a subsidy when I have to, when I'm subject to regulation that takes part of, part of our property. And would you let me, let me, yeah, let, let me answer. And um, honestly, uh, I think, again, you have a vastly different uh, view of what goes on in Lane County than, than I do. And you say you've been doing it 20 years, and that's great. I've been doing it for 20 years anyway, too. And so we have a different point of view, and I respect your point of view, and uh, appreciate uh, you know your comments. Um, can I? I plant 12 pounds the acre. <laughs> well, you know, when you look at, when you look at older stands of trees, uh, you know, we may harvest, uh, you know, 50, 100 trees per acre. And when we plant, we plant many more than that. The reason for that is that we want to, in the process of growing those trees, select the best trees and to make sure that we do have a, a crop for the future. Make a lot of effort to make sure that we care for the soil, care for the water, and uh, make sure that uh, the trees are going to, you know, to be growing there in the, in the future. Okay, uh, Marie has. Yeah. yeah, so about your, to address your sustainability issue, I think my, I thought my presentation spelled it out well, that we've been evolving, we've been changing, we've been adapting to new practices to, make sure that we're producing more with the soil we have and leaving it better for the next generation. So I guess, I'm then, and for the record, we don't receive any subsidies. I don't, grass seed is not included in the farm bill. <laughs> and so I, yeah, that's not even, I can't even answer that question because I don't get subsidies. So, but yes, Bill. I, I, oh, would, sorry. I would say that um, there are lots of definitions of sustainability, but as a five generation farmer, I would say that is Say, I had one other thing too you, that you and I were talking about, and you mentioned a subsidy for forestry. Can you? Oh, okay. I guess I just misunderstood. Okay. Oh, yes. You're next. Thank you. No, thank you. Well, she says no. I'm sorry. Well, just he'll repeat your question. So if you just say it. Okay. So my question is all of these insect. These things that are going into the watershed are killing our fish. And this is a, may I have the mic? Other people have had the mic. Okay. So I, I think the way we're gonna handle the mic, which is our kind of standard mode with Science Pub is um, you just, the audience member will just ask your question and then we will have it, the speaker repeat it 
so then not everybody's coming up and taking the mic and we're able to keep things moving. This is question and answer. So. They're making our salmon and our other fisheries not reproduce properly, and they're creating and the the runoff from logging that does not have a sustainable watershed and a sustainable watershed boundary, which should be at least 200 yards or something, really needs to be addressed. And the chemicals that have the runoff are really problematic for our watershed species and that's bad for our economy so yeah okay uh, again we have a statement about chemicals in watersheds okay are, are we gonna talk or are we gonna listen uh, anyway Um, thank you. Uh, we had a question about chemicals and watersheds, and uh, I guess I, the, the, probably the most recent and the best study that I can uh, reference would be the study the Eugene Water and Electric Board did on the McKenzie River that showed that those chemicals were not present in the water. And industry has nothing to do with that study. That study was independent by the Water Board, and uh, so again, I would, uh, I'm afraid I'd have to respectfully disagree with your statement. I got lots of questions. That's a, that guy in the back with the. Um, good question. So basically, how many farms are in an organization and talking about beginning farmers, um, first generation farmers? Um, I don't know the number of farmers in our organization, uh, but I know we probably have, I don't know, I guess raise your hand here if you're a farmer in my organization. <laughs> There's a few of you in the room. So <laughs> yeah, um, and that's just the people who are able to come tonight. So we have, we have, you know, it's farmers and forest foresters together. There's a lot of us from different backgrounds in different parts of the county. As for your first generation question, um, I I do feel for someone trying to get into farming with the capital expenses, with the, the equipment and the land costs. I mean, yeah, it's it's not fun and, and yeah, trust me. <laughs> and, um, but what I would say is there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of farmers retiring whose kids don't want to come back to the farm. And I honestly, I think there's a lot of opportunities for people. I know a first generation farmer, he's in a part of our organization, who went to work for a farmer when he was just, you know, in his young 20s, and now he is taking over that farm in Junction City. Um, so there's opportunities there, and that's, I mean, that's one way I would recommend it. I know how it's been done. And then, you know, there's Farm Bureau has young farmers and ranchers, and I know Oregon State has a lot of, Extension has a lot of resources as well on budgeting, because, um, is I used to work in ag lending and that was one of the things people would come in and they have these these dreams of owning a farm and a ranch and I'd say well where are the numbers and they wouldn't know how to budget or where to start and that's one of the basic things is you need to, you need to know your numbers and you need you need to pencil out in the end because <laughs> that's all part there's you know sustainability is a three-legged stool you got your economics your environment and your social responsibility and so yeah that if the economics part of that stool doesn't work then it's not going to work at all. So,
Well, soil, soil protection and uh, prevention of damages to soil is one of the goals of really anyone who's a forest owner because we do look at soil as the, you know, it's where, where our crop will grow. If you know of someone who is doing something as you allege, you should get hold of the Department of Forestry about that because that is uh, not within the, within the law or the accepted forest pro practice to do that. Yes. Well, it's very common that, that straw will be used not only for mulch, but also used as a, uh, to keep, to keep uh, suspended sediment that's, that's in water uh, to trap that so it doesn't make it into uh, flowing, flowing water. Other? Yes, sir. You know, I'm sorry. I, I did not really understand what you said. I'm kind of hard of hearing. Could you could you maybe repeat that? Maybe do you know do you know what the question? Why don't you go? Uh, you you asked basically how many acres we're farming, how many people per acre we have, <laughs> and what's our capital investment? Yeah. Well, if my grandpa or my dad were in the room, he'd be rude. They'd be both, both be, be like, that's none of your business. But <laughs> it's a kind of a taboo subject around our house, but I'm okay. To, I mean, I think it's something people need to know. We farm around 3,500 acres, and on the farm, it's me, my husband, my dad, my mom, and we have two hired guys that work with us full time year round. Um, in the summertime, we hire about 10 high school and college kids to run equipment for us. And that's a perfect summer job for them. They work six weeks, make nice money. So I don't, I don't know what that people ratio accounts to, but we're a few people with a lot of acres, I guess, so to speak. And then, um, oh, and then we have our seed cleaning facility, which we staffs two people year round, and then kids in the summertime to sack seed. As for capital investment, well, um, you know, one reason Oregon's so great at growing grass seed is we have their mild winters and our um, really dry, hot summers, and the the. That's awesome, but the, also the, the kind of the, the hindrance of that is we have to get it done in a short period of time. We have six weeks to get the crop in before it starts raining. Our rule of thumb down um, here in Camaswell, because you know once it starts raining on that soil, we can't get back out there, is to get everything done by September 15th. And because of that, we need specialized equipment and we need you know the equipment to get it done. So you know the combine you saw up there, I guess it it's costs about a small house around $350,000 for a combine. Um, wind drawers run a little less than that, about half of that. Um, and so, yeah, there's a lot of capital investment, but it's required to get the job done. They're used for six weeks and they sit in the barn, and I wish there was other ways we could utilize them. Um, you know, in the Midwest, they have custom harvest crews where they, the wheat crews start in Texas and move up to Montana, which is, I think it'd be a blast to drive combine or just drive equipment <laughs> that round, see all kinds of different farms. Um, and Midwest farmers have one combine because they can harvest until Christmas, if not longer. So that's kind of where that's at. Yes. Please. Okay. So uh huh. Yeah, you're welcome. Yes, sir. Yes it, is. yes, it is. Oh, uh, the uh, question, about, uh, question about buffer spray space for cutting uh, to protect, protect streams. And 
you know, the, the uh, question of what is it, it's very complicated. It depends on the size of the stream. It depends on whether it has fish. And it's complicated enough that if you're a forester, you have to go to a manual to figure out exactly what you need to do. So I'm not really prepared to give you, you know, a number. But it's same thing, same thing. I have to go, I have to, go to a manual and figure it out. And it's uh, in the, you know, it's in the tens times something else uh, to, uh, in buffer, depending upon what the size of the stream is. Can you go by the same rules that warehouse or village? Yes, yes. For instance, I can tell you that under the, the previous rules, the stream buffer that I showed you, uh, that there was no activity within 20 feet, and then there was a certain basal area of which we had an abundance of basal area and, and shade that went out to 40 feet. And that would be just an example, but I remember that one because I had to actually figure that one out myself. Yes? I have, yes. Oh, yeah. Because we looked into all of this cold strip that put in the Oregon Forest Forest Group, and it appears that what we found is only corporations that are spreading together. It's quite together. I'm sorry, what? What did you, what chemicals did you gather? Oh, again, I'm not going to go through a whole list of chemicals, but it was for, it was for brush control and it was done by a licensed applicator. That was actually done in Douglas County. Oh, oh okay, so you went to Lee County. Yeah. It is not, oh. Herbicides are, are a valuable tool that uh, people can choose to use or choose not to use, but I guarantee you that nobody uses it any more than they need to. It's, not expen it, it's expensive to do it, it's complicated to do it, and I only do it when it's necessary, and if I can drive down the road and see a scotch broom and pull it out, I will do that, and I'm sure most anybody would do that, because scotch broom doesn't have a lot of fans in Western Oregon. Yeah, I'd be glad to. Um, we are a corporation. That's uh, that's just the way the that's the way the laws work. We're a corporation. We're Very a good friend of mine. Are you a corporation? Yeah, we're a corporation. Very good friend of mine that owns a small sawmill that employs I don't know less than a hundred people. He's a corporation. Most businesses are corporations, and uh, uh, you know I think that. Uh, probably calling someone corporate versus non-corporate can can be 
um, may be confusing. Well, I uh, no, even the shareholder doesn't work because the way we're set up, we're shareholders. In our case, they are. Well, no, but lots of co there are lots of very large corporations that are not publicly traded. Okay. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Thanks, everybody, for all the great questions.